Okay, let me start in. This lecture is about national security, and it's about uh, the conflict that's evolved uh, during the 20th century between national security and environmental quality and human health. Uh, so I want to explore that because so much money in the world is spent on national security, uh, and it has the potential to, to uh, invade individual rights, uh, to diminish personal freedom, uh, to diminish privacy. Uh, at the same time, it has the potential to concentrate power and authority among elites, uh, political elites, uh, wealthy elites, uh, technical elites, uh, and <clears throat> so that it, it's threatening to uh, democratic participation and, and uh, policy making in a variety of ways. Uh, and as we move through the course, you'll find that uh, secrecy is not just an issue that uh, we need to figure out how to manage better in the public sector relative to classified information, and this is the topic of today's session, but it's also a critical issue in the private sector. Uh, the growing use of confidential business information, uh, the gl gl growing obscurity of product ingredients as uh, globalized markets uh, cause products and services to uh, cross national borders uh, without any clear identity about uh, components or potential effects. So national security and environmental quality. And I want you to think about uh, this case and other cases that we deal with as a, a problem of managing intelligence. I'm not meaning to imply that uh, other people are not intelligent. I'm thinking about intelligent. I'm, I'm meaning to uh, hopefully get you to think about the idea uh, of a legal system that would produce uh, a public that was literate and, and capable of understanding the quality of the environment around them, uh, what's threatening and, and what's not, so that potentially they could, they could manage uh, their exposure to, uh, to chemicals. They could manage uh, the effect of human behavior on, on uh, uh, a variety of environmental issues such as endangered species. So the, the, the purpose for the title of, of my book that I'm having you read, you poor things, uh, is, is uh, the idea of thinking about the origin of knowledge. You know, where do we get the information? Where do we get the data? Uh, where do we get the knowledge? Who produces it? Uh, and what we'll see today is that uh, knowledge about uh, the environmental effects of national security are produced predominantly uh, by the Defense Department. Uh, they control sites. Uh, they control the technology uh, in weaponry and weapon delivery systems, uh, making it extremely difficult for the public to understand uh, really what the dangers might be. Where does the knowledge flow? Is it intelligible? Uh, is it understood? The distinction between is it intelligible and is it understood is really critical. It involves uh, li literacy. It uh, involves educational background, uh, technical competence. Uh, and who owns it? This is really a key question for law. Uh, you can think about this in terms of it being an intellectual property right question. Uh, should the public own it? Uh, should the public be able to keep, should the government be able to keep the knowledge uh, from the public? Uh, should the private sector be allowed to own it? Uh, and should they be allowed to keep knowledge from the, the public? So think about it as a problem of understanding production and flow of knowledge. Uh, because environmental quality is always going to be elusive until we, we uh, create a public that really is uh, far more intelligent, so to speak, uh, understanding uh, than it currently is. So what are the purposes of secrecy? And I'm kind of fascinated by uh, uh, the growing uh, classification of information in the public sector so that uh, in, in U.S. history, never before has the government been classifying more information uh, than it is today. You know, at the same time, there's a very interesting uh, uh, kind of cultural uh, uh, change that we're witnessing in, in your generation uh, related to Facebook. I mean, I've never seen a generation be uh, so interested in revealing uh, secrets or information about themselves as your generation is. So it's a disconnect in, in a way between uh, government policy and, and uh, what's going on at, uh, uh, in, in social circles among younger generations. How do terror and warfare depend upon secrecy? When does secrecy threaten national security? When is secrecy necessary for national security? Uh, and how is it related to individual rights? These are key questions that I hope you'll keep in mind as we move through this lecture today. There are common scripts in environmental history, no matter whether or not uh, you consider this case or uh, the case of uh, endangered species, the case of, of uh, uh, managing water quality, uh, ma managing uh, sustainable agriculture. Who knew about uh, the problem? Who knew about contaminants in this case? When did they know? When do they inform the public? And what do they do about the problem? 
These are critical questions, and secrecy is, is a, a central component of all of them. So that the history that I want to go through today is really one uh, that is very brief. It only spans the period between 1944 and 1963. So in this period, uh, the atomic weapons, the first atomic weapons were designed and tested. Uh, the first one at uh, Los Alamos in uh, New Mexico in 1945, followed by two uh, uh, uses of atomic weapons, the only two uh, aggressive uses in, in uh, world history, uh, one on Hiroshima and the other on Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands of people and resulting in, in injuries and death and heritable uh, mutations uh, that uh, have, has uh, affected generations of Japanese. Uh, so this compressed period is really quite striking. Now, uh, why in the world would we be talking about this issue, uh, which seems so old now, it's part of the Cold War, uh, in, in a class on uh, current environmental law and policy? Well, I'll tell you a, a bit of a story. In uh, uh, 2003, I was in the Beinecke Rare Book Library. And if, I don't know if you have visited the Beinecke Library, uh, but uh, it really is a remarkable place. It's got a wonderful, rich uh, uh, store of, of information, especially on the American West. Uh, but I found out uh, just by sur surfing uh, the net that they, they also have all of Rachel Carson's original research material. Now, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring uh, and The Sea Around Us and a number of other books and is rather famous in uh, uh, environmental history, uh, particularly for her work uh, trying to get the public to wake up about the dangers of pesticides especially related to wildlife because she was a wildlife biologist working for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, it turns out that all of her original research materials, uh, including about uh, 120 boxes of material, are stored in the, in the basement of Beinecke Library. So going through those as I was trying to understand the history of pesticides, uh, I found one file that was on nuclear weapons testing. Uh, and that file was incredibly dense. Uh, and uh, as she, as she uh, conducted her research, by the way, it's very different than uh, what we do today, uh, which w when our research is almost all electronic, uh, she would hand copy material. There were no copy machines uh, that she, she had access to at that point in time. Uh, and then she would write notes, little side notes, interpreting it as she went along. So going through this, I realized that, that all of her work uh, on pesticides, where she wondered what happened to them once they were released, uh, where they went, uh, how did they make their way into the soil? Why were wildlife uh, the canaries in the, uh, in the mine, in a sense? Uh, what were the wildlife telling us about human hazards and human risk? Uh, and, and what was wrong with current law and policy uh, that would al allow that kind of release and uh, non-accountability on the part of, of the private sector? So she learned that way of thinking, uh, that, uh, that narrative logic. Uh, she learned that uh, not by studying pesticides, by looking at the history of the Atomic Energy Commission in the 1950s and how they came to understand uh, radionuclides and what happened to them and the kind of threat they posed uh, to water quality, to air quality, how they got into wildlife, how they got into human tissue. So this is the story of today. <clears throat> so the idea that uh, the success in any of these cases is dependent upon very high quality science is a very important idea. And remember what I said the other day that uh, perhaps 95% of the science uh, in the field of environmental science uh, is conducted in the private sector. It never sees the light of day. Well, in this case, this is probably the, uh, the best example of state science at an enormous scale. The Atomic Energy Commission uh, had an unlimited budget, they had unlimited authority, uh, and they had uh, uh, unlimited uh, capacity to tell a story about uh, danger and, and uh, the, the importance of pursuing atomic weapons development in order to protect national security. So this time span uh, just gives you the number of tests per year uh, between 1945, or actually the number of explosions, 1945 and uh, 1962. Uh, 1963, President Kennedy uh, uh, worked to, with the Soviets to, to pass the uh, limited test ban treaty, and since that time, uh, uh, atm atmospheric testing has been severely limited. No nuclear tests worldwide between 45 and, and 96, uh, roughly about 2,000, maybe about 2,400. After 1963, the majority of tests, or the number of tests actually went up, uh, but most of them went underground. So underground testing is allowed, and we'll see later on in the, in the lecture 
uh, that uh, there have been certain parts of the world that uh, it's, it's been agreed uh, among uh, nations that have this nuclear uh, capacity uh, to avoid testing. So outer space is now off limits. Uh, testing in uh, the South Pacific is now off limits because it was the site of, of, of many uh, highly uh, intense tests uh, of, of uh, hydrogen bombs. And also uh, testing in, uh, on the poles is, is uh, restricted by international agreement. So this is a very limited period of time. And many people don't understand where these tests were conducted. Some in the South Atlantic, some in Mississippi, uh, some in uh, Japan, New Mexico, the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Nevada test site, uh, Johnson Island, <coughs> Christmas Island, a new attack, and Bikini, which are part of the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. I'll be speaking more about this and show you some film clips uh, on uh, next Tuesday when we reconvene. One interesting uh, aspect of this history was the behavior of Klaus Fuchs, uh, who was a theoretical scientist working at Los Alamos on the development of the first weapon, the first atomic bomb, uh, during what is known as the Manhattan Project, and he had access to top secret material. Uh, a very, very highly skilled uh, uh, physicist, <coughs> and he passed most of what he knew on to the Soviets in the late 1940s. Uh, so he was tried and convicted of espionage in Britain in the 1950s, and he served nine years out of a 14-year sentence. This is fascinating to me. And think about the nature of the sanction here, so that the Soviets gained their understanding of, of uh, how the U.S. Uh, produced nuclear weapons and gained an understanding of, of uh, what our strategy was, uh, how we were testing it, how we were monitoring the effects, what the intensity of the radiation was, and the man uh, serves only nine years in prison. Lesson uh, is kind of curious. Uh, most secrets have very short lives, and the more valuable they are, uh, the more limited is their life. So uh, I think about uh, the idea of creating a secret as creating a property right. And uh, so it creates a property right, uh, and its value is, is uh, dependent on many aspects uh, of, its, of its character, and uh, we'll explore that as we move through. Uh, the power of explosions on the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific is something to take note of. Uh, and next Tuesday, we'll come back to this story uh, where the Bikini Islanders were removed from their island uh, through negotiation and the use of eminent domain. And then the U.S. Uh, proceeded to uh, test about uh, 25, 26 uh, different nuclear weapons, including the, uh, the Bravo test in 1954 uh, that I'll show you a clip of, uh, in, which was one of the largest bombs ever exploded by the U.S. in the atmosphere. <clears throat> the Atomic Energy Commission uh, created what they uh, called Project Gabriel. Uh, that evolved to be called Project Sunshine uh, that lasted between 1949 and 1961. So Project Sunshine, Sunshine uh, became famous, and it was the uh, collection of scientists in the government uh, uh, working with the Atomic Energy Commission based predominantly at the University of Chicago uh, and Columbia University, the uh, Lamont Laboratories. So scientists were given uh, you know, virtually uh, uh, unlimited funds to, to conduct research that uh, would help the Atomic Energy Commission understand the power of their different weapons, and there's some 200 different types of, of nuclear weapons eventually that were, were designed, uh, and some uh, uh, so large that they had to redesign aircraft in order to, to handle the weight, and others so small that they could be tactically carried in a suitcase uh, and, and uh, be used under uh, uh, field conditions that were very difficult. Uh, different delivery mechanisms, uh, delivery by aircraft, delivery by missile, uh, delivery by uh, uh, artillery, uh, uh, delivery by suitcase, so that uh, you know, a variety of different uh, types of bombs of different strengths and, uh, were, were designed for different uh, uh, types of warfare. So the Sunshine scientists really ramped up in the early 1950s, and what, what's interesting is the way that they thought about environmental science. Uh, they wondered what happened to the radionuclides. You know, where do they go when a bomb explodes? What happens? Well, you know, dust particles get blown up into the atmosphere. Uh, if you drop a bomb in shallow water, it will take uh, uh, the material on the bottom of the water, and it will take the fish, and it will basically blow the, everything up and the coral up into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, it will also uh, uh, kill any birds that uh, are in close proximity. So every test has a story about uh, birds raining from the sky on fire. Uh, it will also uh, 
uh, cause a, a pattern of movement in the atmosphere that uh, depends very much upon climate and wind conditions. Uh, and the power of the bomb determines how high up into the atmosphere the particles get. So dozens and dozens of different nuclides are created, uh, that some of which uh, had never been recognized before. So uh, trying to figure this out, one of the first things they did uh, was they set up a monitoring system. <clears throat> that makes sense. If you want to figure out uh, where something is going, you set up a, a, a monitoring system. In this case, it was rather simplistic. Uh, around uh, the Nevada test site north of Las Vegas, about 65 miles, and people used to cluster on tops of the casinos and the hotels in the evening to watch the, uh, the bombs explode or get up really early mo in, in the morning to watch the bombs explode, uh, highly visible uh, given the, the, uh, the clear climate. So they set up their monitors and they, <coughs> they presumed that uh, they had captured the dispersal of rec uh, uh, radiation. Uh, and then they began to get reports. Uh, reports uh, came in from different parts of the country, uh, some in North Dakota from people that were mining for uranium uh, that uh, had carried Geiger counters and uh, one miner uh, was, was telling a story where he was eating dinner at his campfire with his Geiger counter that he forgot to turn off and uh, the Geiger counter stopped, uh, started to uh, uh, spit back at him. And he said, oh boy, you know, I've got to have this thing serviced. It's, it must be out of tune. It must be uh, detecting something <coughs> that uh, is not there. So he took it in to have it serviced and found out that it, it, was, it was actually uh, in, in great tune and <coughs> didn't need to be recalibrated. <coughs> he went back to his site and it happened again. So he realized that uh, <coughs> gradually that something was going on in the atmosphere. It wasn't measuring anything in the mine or uh, in nearby rock because it, it normally in that place would be, uh, would be silent. <coughs> he was picking up radionuclides that were raining down in North Dakota. Uh, Polaroid became Im important in the, the process of, of understanding the distribution, Polaroid Film Company, uh, because its film was found to be exposed when it arrived at doctor's offices and hospitals in different parts of the world. And at that point in time, they used to, to uh, put uh, the, the Polaroid film, uh, the uh, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheets, into boxes, and then they would pack the boxes, you know, not with these styrofoam kernels that we use today <coughs> that will never go away, uh, but instead uh, they used to pack it with uh, corn husks. So <coughs> gradually they uh, uh, figured it out because they could see in some cases uh, the image of the corn husk uh, on top of the, the, uh, the film matching directly. So what was happening? Well, the radionuclides were inter intersecting a cloud. They were raining down, in this case, in the Midwestern part of the United States, uh, where the box had been packed. And the corn husks uh, were exposing the film because they had absorbed the radionuclides. So they realized gradually that their donut, uh, 200 uh, miles in diameter around Las Vegas, was uh, completely inappropriate to capture the scale of this problem. This is a very important lesson in environmental science and environmental policy. policy. It's like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the, the, the analogy of the, the drunk leaning on uh, a light post looking for his, uh, his car keys. Uh, why is he looking under the light post? That's because that's where the light is. Uh, so that uh, the, there are many, many different stories about uh, the failure of environmental science uh, and the ineffectiveness of environmental law that flow from this problem of uh, misunderstanding uh, the need for a very sensitive sampling design. In this case, the uh, Stokes test in 1957 uh, put radionuclides into the atmosphere, but they started moving in different directions at different altitudes. Ooh, there's an interesting idea. That's novel. Uh, no one thought about that before. So here the uh, dashed line at the bottom is moving at 30,000 feet, <coughs> whereas uh, the, and it, uh, it just nicks the southeast side of Idaho, uh, whereas the, the, the dust at 10,000 feet shoots all the way up to Montana. Then it arcs up over southern Canada, comes back over the Great Lakes, and you see that arc uh, of the dashed line coming right down uh, across Lake Champlain and the New York-Vermont border, the Massachusetts-New York border, and then the Connecticut border. Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, another test that they, they followed created dust clouds that, uh, again, were driven by weather patterns. And you see in this case that uh, at 30,000 feet, one swirled around Texas for about a week. Another one swooped all the way at 20,000 feet down into Florida. Uh, probably would have been detected in, if they had rainstorms in Florida at the time of the dust, dust cloud that got there. That would have been detectable in, in uh, orange, oranges, in orange juice, and uh, in orange oils. Uh, so that uh, crops were being threatened and exposed in, in a variety of different ways. 
that uh, were being driven by weather patterns. And we all know that even today it's hard to predict what the weather's going to be uh, within 36 hours in many parts of the country. So that uh, the, the, the state of weather forecasting back at this time was uh, quite primitive. Uh, so that basically told these scientists, and, and again, I can just imagine what they were doing, sitting uh, you know, across the table looking at each other, how are we going to manage this? What's going to happen if the public understands this? How are we going to maintain our political support for the, the weapons testing program uh, so that we can keep on building these weapons uh, to uh, contain the Soviets or to, to strike fear into their hearts following their policy of deterrence? The bigger the bomb, the less likely we are to be uh, attacked by uh, other nations that would understand that an attack would be uh, simply suicide. Well, here is a chart uh, which is an amalgamation of different uh, uh, bomb blasts and the pathways that they took. Uh, and the darkest areas are areas that receive the highest doses of radiation. And uh, these nuclides have half-lives that vary between uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, three uh, to four weeks up to uh, uh, 40, 50, 100 years. Uh, so that if you went to the, to, uh, the center of the, the country in, in Iowa and you took uh, tests of the soil, you could still detect many of these radionuclides in the soil. And they are transferable from uh, soil to uh, crops and, and up to, uh, to, to fruits. <clears throat> so that uh, this patchiness and fallout was eventually recognized by the Atomic Energy Commission in the mid-1950s. And gradually, you know, once this information was declassified in the early 1990s, and the only reason I'm telling you this story is because most of this uh, knowledge was eventually declassified, I couldn't be here, which is kind of an interesting thought. I couldn't be here right now telling you this story uh, had the declassification process not, not occurred under the Clinton administration. Uh, once they realized that, that the Atomic Energy Commission had kept all this information uh, from the public, when they really had no national security logic to do so. So here is a, a, a map of the United States constructed by the National Cancer Institute uh, in the late 1990s uh, that took the dose estimates that they got from the soils because they could calcu back calculate the concentrations from existing concentrations knowing the decay rate of different nuclides. And they, they developed this map of, of expected doses. And then uh, the, the, the Cancer Institute started asking questions uh, because they understood the dose-response relationship for radiation and these nuclides is really pretty clear. This is not like, uh, you know, you have to drink uh, uh, 10,000 cans of, of diet soda uh, to absorb enough saccharin to, uh, to, to elevate your cancer risk a little bit. Uh, this, is a, this is a science that uh, uh, evolved in the 1950s largely because of, of the importance to the military uh, that understood the dose-response relationship uh, quite clearly. So, but understanding a dose-response relationship, meaning, let's see, the best way to explain dose-response relationship, if, you, if it's not familiar to you, is to, uh, especially for college students, is to think about uh, uh, a six-pack of beer. So, a six-pack of beer, you have one beer. You know, you might feel a little bit of it. Uh, you have two beers. Uh, you have two beers within 15 minutes. I know you'd never do that. Uh, you have three beers within 20 minutes. Uh, you have six beers within uh, an hour. Uh, so that uh, <clears throat> the, the effect that you feel, the effect on your body, uh, depends upon the dose and the concentration that you're actually uh, circulating in your system. So they understood this relationship uh, with great clarity with respect to these radionuclides, so that the cancer estimates really are quite robust. One interesting thing is that <clears throat> if you look at the pattern of testing that uh, really it uh, peaked in the late 1950s, uh, so that uh, you see, it, you see uh, this is radionuclides uh, in rainwater, and then there was an agreement not to test for a period of two years, and you see that the rainwater levels declined. It's in the rainwater. Hmm, that's interesting. It's in the rainwater. What does that mean for uh, fish? What does it mean for rivers? What does it mean for uh, parts of the West that uh, experience high levels of snowpack? Well, uh, it means that uh, snowpack, uh, for example, uh, Jackson, Wyoming, a couple years ago, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming received more than 600 inches of snow in, in one year. And in a matter of uh, about uh, a month, uh, in, in the period between April and, and uh, late May, uh, you get basically warmer weather melting all the snow. So in this period of time, you get this rush. You get this pulse of radioactive water that moves into a stream. And lo and behold, where could you test that? Well, you could test that in the supermarket. 
Where? In, in what supermarket? In salmon supermarket, trout supermarket, trout, buying trout in the super, supermarket. You could find uh, the, uh, these levels increasing in the, in the uh, Columbia River uh, that goes by the Hanford uranium enrichment plant, plutonium enrichment plant in Washington, in the state of Washington. So the water levels, concentrations were going up because the rainwater concentrations were going up and the, the fish concentrations were going up. Uh, and also people that were drinking water out of wells uh, that were fed underground by the aquifer from the Hanford area, they were also being exposed. The per capita dose was calculated as well, and you see the, uh, the dip between 1960, January of 1960, uh, and uh, late 1962 during the uh, uh, agreed uh, uh, cessation of testing. So uh, this information was, was really quite, quite robust. So Project Sunshine uh, basically pieced together this idea that these nuclides were in global circulation. Uh, they were contaminating every aspect of our environment, uh, and they were making their way into humans. And particularly, uh, 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 they were concerned about strontium-90 because uh, if you have a diet that is low in calcium, your body's going to absorb more strontium-90 into your bone. Uh, also, if you have uh, 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 a diet that's low in iodine, uh, your thyroid is going to absorb more iodine-131 uh, than it normally would. So understanding this, uh, uh, this relationship between uh, uh, Calcium in strontium-90 is very important because it eventually led to calcium enrichment of breads, uh, of milk. Uh, so the fort fortification program was really, uh, uh, it really had its origination in recommendations by the Atomic Energy Commission. So the public thought, oh, we're just getting more uh, minerals in our, in our diet. Well, that must be a good thing. The nutritionists must be arguing that uh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, but in reality, what was going on was that the Atomic Energy Commission was uh, anxiously wringing its hands, recognizing that they've got to figure out how to lower the dose being experienced in the population. The population had no idea what was going on. So Project Sunshine scientists, they eventually obtained 15,000 bodies, dead bodies, trying to understand the distribution of these uh, nuclides throughout the world. Uh, bodies from New York, San Francisco, Houston, uh, Japan, India, South Africa. Why from other nations? Well, predominantly because they were worried about uh, other nations uh, coming back and, and uh, uh, telling the United States that we were contaminating not only their food supplies, which was going to harm their, their ability to trade products internationally, uh, processed foods, uh, uh, water, uh, uh, just about uh, any kind of, of uh, uh, crop you could think of, as well as animals. Uh, so that uh, gradually over the period between 1955 and 1960, the Atomic Energy Commission uh, grew to really understand the global distributional pattern uh, and how, how people in uh, certain areas of, of Latin America and tropical areas were really experiencing quite high levels of fallout. Why would that be? Uh, in tropical rainforests, they experience intense rainfall uh, so that uh, the rain was so high that uh, it, would, it would concentrate uh, the, the nuclides in, in uh, some of the tropical forest areas. So permission to take the body parts was never sought or obtained. Uh, family members were, were never consulted. Uh, bones were cleaned and packaged in formalin. Uh, and then they were crushed and analyzed by laboratory technicians at Columbia and, and uh, other prestigious U.S. institutions, academic institutions. Uh, and sometimes the bones were pooled together. Uh, gradually they decided that they were going to look for geographic variability, and they were going to look for age-related variability because they were finding that uh, kids, for some reason, were absorbing more of the radionuclides, especially strontium, than, than adults were. So why would that be? Was it something about their diet? Was there something about their physiology? Well, it, it had to do with their, their rate of, of uh, growth of bone. So kids, uh, kids are, are growing most rapidly. At what point in their lives? Well, uh, from time of conception, roughly till the time of 13, but different organ systems and different functions in the body uh, mature at different rates. So statue, stature, for example, is, is quite li linear, although you get this really serious uh, growth curve um, uh, in, in utero, uh, and then it goes up uh, gradually, gradually, and then uh, more steeply uh, during the early teenage years. So you could figure out the concentrations that were correlated with these periods of rapid growth and, and development. So, you know, gradually uh, these secrets started to, to leak out. Uh, 
Uh, and the U.S. began to study fallout data. And once the Soviets had developed their own capacity to make and, and test uh, nuclear weapons, the Atomic Energy Commission had this great argument. Well, there are nuclides in our food supply and in our bodies. It's not our fault. Well, we take some responsibility, but it's the Soviets' fault. The Soviets were actually testing these weapons up in Siberia, uh, and so the Siberian radionuclides were, tended to come down uh, across Alaska and across Canada and into the, the uh, western and, and midwestern part of the U.S. So in, in, in threads that are similar to the ones that I showed you from the uh, Nevada test site. So the, the U.S. was, was uh, trying to, uh, at this point, desperately maintain public support for continued testing, uh, in part because they were wondering, well, you know, what would happen if we did have a, a, a nuclear war? Uh, you know, what, where would the nuclides go? And uh, what would our capacity to respond be? So these were legitimate uh, national security concerns uh, that they were exploring. So uh, the U.S. began to, to uh, release some of its information at the same time that uh, states started their own testing programs. So, you know, just like um, uh, you find variability in air pollution today from uh, motor vehicles, depending upon climate and, and uh, where vehicle use is most intense, uh, you find, uh, in this case, uh, states being worried about uh, specific patterns of concentration uh, in the crops that, that uh, they grow. Vermont cheese, for example, uh, or uh, Midwestern grains, uh, or uh, cattle grazed in, uh, in the Western U U.S. So Minnesota, Vermont, and other <coughs> states uh, felt like they were environmental hotspots, and they, that their uh, uh, corporations were being hindered. Their capacity to trade uh, nationally and uh, internationally was, was being diminished. The U.S. finally started uh, an open test of, of milk for radioactivity in 1957, 12 years after the explosions began. Uh, and Linus Pauling, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in, in, uh, for his work on nutrition, uh, particularly related to vitamin C, uh, came out with, with his conclusion that the body really discriminates against strontium and favors calcium uptake if the calcium levels were high enough. Uh, that prompted the, uh, the addition of, uh, of the calcium, as I was saying, to milk, bread, and animal feeds, as well as fertilizers. So <clears throat> uh, this is quite, quite curious. The Surgeon General uh, for the U.S. denied that the fallout hazards were serious in, in uh, the New York Times in, in 1959. And uh, so there was, there was really quite an open public debate in the late, uh, in the late 50s, uh, in part that surrounded Eisenhower's campaign to become president again in, in uh, uh, 1956. And his competitor was his vice president, Adelaide Stevenson. Uh, so Stevenson uh, basically broke the news that uh, the Atomic Energy Commission had been hiding this information from the public. <clears throat> and uh, in, the, in his uh, last minute uh, campaign effort, uh, he, he claimed that there were genetic hazards to future generation, uh, risk of bone cancer, and uh, the inability to conduct medical investigations. Now, this is interesting. Uh, so that, that uh, there's exposure that is universal. Everybody's exposed because everybody eats. Uh, and that means that, that you really don't have any opportunity for a scientific control group that is unexposed to figure out what the long-term health effects might be. Thirteen Yale scientists, including Arthur Galston of the uh, biology department, uh, who passed away just uh, uh, a few years ago, signed a statement uh, endorsing the views of Stevenson. Stevenson lost. Eisenhower uh, became president again. And uh, what was interesting about it is that, that uh, transcripts from his, his uh, conferences, his uh, uh, national security uh, team, uh, had been released in the late 1990s as well. And, and <coughs> Eisenhower uh, eventually got to the point where he was telling his staff that uh, uh, the levels of radionuclides in the milk supply, the buildup, in, especially in, in uh, children's bones, was unacceptable and something was going to have to happen. And that prompted him to be uh, more aggressive in, in trying to, to uh, negotiate with the Soviets uh, to, uh, to create uh, some sort of a treaty that would reduce atmospheric testing. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump ahead here so I don't run out of time. The Atomic Energy Commission also was found to have withheld data recognizing that there were these spikes in the New York City uh, uh, milk supplies, uh, data that was collected just prior to the election that they understood posed a problem. They held that until weeks after the election. So it's kind of curious that milk became the standard for, for trying to figure out uh, uh, where the chemicals went, especially powdered buttermilk because uh, in its dehydrated form, 
uh, it was easy to, uh, to send around the country. And this chart, I think, is also interesting because <clears throat> remember that the, the uh, uh, Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963 uh, really stopped the testing cold. And what you see is a gradual decline uh, in worldwide uh, uh, fallout uh, represented by strontium-90 and cesium-137 in milk. So you see this gradual decline because of the residency time in the atmosphere so that these chemicals uh, don't, uh, don't all wash out like quickly uh, after the explosions. They go into global circulation and there was great debate at the time about uh, the, the amount of time that they stayed in the atmosphere. And the Atomic Energy Commission was arguing, don't worry about it. They're going to stay in the atmosphere for a long period of time. Why would they use that logic? Well, they wanted the radiation to dissipate so that by the time the nuclides got down to the ground that they wouldn't pose such an intense radiation threat. Now, that's kind of an interesting story. So environmentalists and, and uh, public uh, health advocates were arguing, no, you don't understand this pattern of deposition. Uh, it's, often, it's often more quickly that it, that it reaches the ground uh, in, uh, in the higher concentration, the higher uh, intensity uh, of radiation. So that uh, uh, this story played out over the 1970s and 1980s uh, until gradually uh, you, you find uh, uh, 1995 it really leveling off uh, to what it, it is today. Curiously, you see this spike in cesium-137 in 1987, 1986, 1987. Anybody have any idea what that might be? Chernobyl. Chernobyl released more cesium-137 to the atmosphere after the explosion uh, where the dome of the building uh, uh, blew off and uh, there was a, a fire that was uncontainable for a, a period of weeks. It spewed more radiation into the atmosphere in the form of cesium-137 uh, than many of the earlier atmospheric weapons tests did. So <clears throat> I'm, I began by telling you that uh, uh, under conditions of secrecy, uh, the people that uh, hold power over the secret uh, have great narrative advantage. They not only uh, control the, the, the search for the data, they control its interpretation, and they control the story that's told to the general public. And a couple of elements of this story are kind of fun to, to think about because we'll see these, these uh, uh, same narratives evolve for pesticides, for plastics, uh, for a variety of different environmental problems. <clears throat> is the problem human-induced uh, or is it uh, uh, more important to worry about natural sources? Natural sources of radiation. Hmm. So you see these comparisons between the dose that you would get by having a, a glass of milk or uh, having the diet of a child. Comparison between that and number of flights that you would take across the United States. And you probably know that you get a, a measurable dose of radiation uh, when, when you, you're up in aircraft. <clears throat> so this comparison between uh, human-induced uh, exposure compared to natural exposure. Another a good example of that would be radon. And in Connecticut, we have a, a problem with radon gas, which is radioactive, being emitted especially from the kind of rock that we have here, and, and particularly along the coastline, uh, heading east down here along Long Island, Long Island Sound. Uh, and my basement in my house, for example, we had a, a radon problem, where radon gas was uh, not just measurable, it was, it was really quite high. So we had to uh, figure out how to remediate that. You dig a hole in your basement floor, you put a little fan and a pipe in, and you get rid of it. If you don't do that, uh, then you're, you're, you risk exposing your family to, uh, to radon, uh, which is a very well-known carcinogen. Uh, the estimates of, of uh, deaths from radon exposure in the United States are actually quite high. You know, uh, 40 to uh, 50,000 people per year are believed to uh, uh, get lung cancer as a, as a result of, of radon exposure. So that the comparison of, of natural sources of radiation to human-induced sources related to national security uh, protection, uh, there's some legitimacy to that, and you have to be very careful about it. Also, the idea of relative risk. Well, why are we worrying about radiation when we, we should be worrying about other kinds of risks? We'll see that with respect to uh, uh, pesticides, where, where uh, you find, uh, say, the, the uh, car manufacturers uh, concerned about uh, uh, the emission technology requirements uh, under the Clean Air Act for, for uh, uh, tailpipe emissions. Uh, and they, they point to other sources, other critical sources of, of uh, human exposure to air pollutants, such as power plants or incinerators. So this idea of, of risk comparison uh, really uh, was, was well honed in the 1940s and 1950s by the Atomic Energy Commission. And, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, in that case, uh, the concern was uh, to express uh, the risk relative to uh, uh, 
misunderstanding uh, the, the uh, implications of, of nuclear war uh, and, <clears throat> and uh, not being able to protect the public uh, from excessive uh, patterns of exposure. That played out, by the way, in a variety of pretty unusual ways. Uh, so that uh, uh, many people in the 1950s built uh, fallout shelters in their backyard. My neighbors did it. My family never had the, the, the means to do it, but my neighbors had these, these concrete uh, buildings that they built underground. They looked a lot like basements. And they would store water and food, and, and uh, they would practice air drills where they would run down in, into the, the basement. And uh, this was especially important during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we came the closest that we ever have to, to uh, a nuclear war. So <clears throat> the idea of how long do you have to stay in the, in the shelter uh, to protect yourself, uh, well, you wouldn't know that unless you had done these atmospheric tests and you understood uh, how the concentrations diminished over a certain period of time. So the idea of relative risk also uh, deserves merit. This is also an interesting time when uh, the, the first environmentalists uh, had formed their organizations back in uh, the 1940s and 1950s. They tended to be medical doctors. Uh, the very first environmentalists. And the, the, one of the uh, interest groups that you recognize today is Consumers Union that produces Consumer Reports magazine, uh, compares uh, product quality uh, and uh, often uh, environmental or, or health uh, claims of products. So C Consumers Union was very active in collecting milk, uh, in this case from 48 cities around the world. No one talked about human milk, and I found this to be quite fascinating. So uh, for the entire decade, uh, no one spoke about, oh, well, you know, if it's getting into cow's milk, why isn't it getting into human milk? If it's getting into human milk, what's the capacity to be transferring these radionuclides across generations via breastfeeding? Well, in part, I think it was uh, uh, a shyness, uh, a, a reluctance to, uh, to talk about breastfeeding in public, which was common at the time. But it was clearly an issue that the Atomic Energy Commission had recognized, and I found a, a document. It was a document that uh, was declassified, uh, that was produced in 1952, uh, that, uh, that demonstrated quite clearly that the Atomic Energy Commission had made the connection like that. It's in cow's milk. It's going to be in human milk. Uh, we know that uh, these, these compounds uh, are capable of causing mutations in genes, and some of those mutations are inheritable. They can be transferred across generations, in addition to the fact that we're exposing uh, uh, the next generation via, via breast milk in addition to infant formula and milk and other, other parts of a, of a small child or an infant's food supply. Also, uh, the, the group SANE became famous at this point in time, uh, a group that was politically active to protect pregnant women. And this history is the first history uh, in the 20th century where children's health became a logic for, more, uh, for a, a, a stronger set of regulations and rules uh, relative to emitting something that uh, could be thought of as dangerous to the, to the atmosphere. So uh, gradually, uh, by the end of the decade, the Atomic Energy Commission recognized that uh, strontium-90 accumulated in soils, it accumulated in foods, it accumulated in kids. They knew how to calculate what the cancer risk was because they understood the dose-response relationship. So they were basically sitting on a gold mine of knowledge uh, that they had kept from the public uh, as best they could during this period of time. So here's a list of 60 years of experimentation uh, with nuclear weapons. 40 three years, 45 years of negotiation. And you see the Antarctic Treaty, the agreement not to conduct the testing in the Antarctic. Uh, this is common heritage for, for all of mankind, so to speak. You see the hotline agreement uh, before uh, a nuclear war uh, was, was uh, initiated. There was an agreement uh, to call up uh, the Soviets and uh, try a last minute attempt at negotiation. The limited test ban treaty that I just described, the outer space treaty, uh, the the uh, seabed treaty, it's, it's not uh, legal to, to uh, uh, conduct experiments in the seabed. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, common property around the world is, is uh, now protected by international treaty. Uh, however, the United States is testing uh, at a rate that has uh, uh, never been less. Uh, the testing, however, is uh, the majority of it is underground. And I'll show you a clip next, next week of uh, some underground tests uh, that uh, uh, created earthquakes in different parts of the world, uh, particularly in Alaska. And we also see a, a very curious effect where uh, these former testing sites uh, were eventually translated into fish and wildlife reserves. So that's uh, an, uh, another interesting thing to try to explain. And uh, I'm going to close today with uh, one more thought for you. This entire 
story unfolded between 1945 and 1963. Uh, <coughs> the Environmental Com Protection Agency was <coughs> created in 1970, <coughs> and the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, was created in 1976. So there was absolutely no protection, there was no monitoring of public water supplies through this entire period of time. Uh, <coughs> the Clean Air Act was not uh, in existence, so that there was no, con there was no protection against uh, the radionuclides as air pollutants or air contaminants. And finally, <coughs> in 1976, the Environmental Protection Agency set an acceptable radioactivity limit uh, for drinking water of one millisievert, or that can be translated into 0.1 rem per year. How about radionuclides in food? Uh, one would think that this history uh, would provide a very good logic for establishing limits for radionuclides in food. Uh, but, you know, as the Chernobyl event in 1986 uh, unfolded, we realized that we were not alone in not having any sort of limits for radionuclides in food. Uh, neither did any of the European Union nations, so trade was completely disrupted. Uh, tens of billions of dollars of food was lost following the Chernobyl event because Italy had one standard for, for acceptable uh, contamination, whereas Germany had another. Uh, they, all the nations had different standards. But just keep this in mind that the uh, <coughs> United States still has no maximal permi maximum uh, permissible limits. The takeaway point here, simply, when secrecy is combined with the absence of environmental and health surveillance, <coughs> the public opinion and politics favor the development of hazardous technologies. <coughs> in this case, uh, this knowledge was controlled by elites uh, and then re released selectively to an unknowing public uh, in an attempt to, to encourage them to uh, favor continued atomic weapons testing. 